When Internews started in Kenya, we were an HIV program, a public health program. You know, sub-Saharan Africa is worst hit by HIV, but the reportage didn't tell that story. It was stigmatizing, it was scientifically not accurate, and editors spoke of AIDS fatigue. One cannot get tired of a story that is so important to people. HIV was a problem. In 2003, when Internews was starting, stigma and discrimination of people living with HIV was still very high. There was stigma of even producers starting programs to do with HIV and AIDS because they didn't, know, they didn't want to interact with people living with HIV because of the fear of getting infected. So Internews knew it was important to move in because media could make a difference. And I think we made a big difference. We started training radio journalists in HIV and AIDS. In 2007, it started training TV journalists, still on storytelling in HIV and AIDS. In 2008, it started training print journalists. In 2007, though, another threat loomed as Kenyan journalists turned their attention from HIV to a contentious presidential election. A bitter sectarian conflict put journalists under unprecedented pressure. And the politicians had their own agenda and they were forcing the newsrooms. When I'm in charge of the news desk, I'm trying to show this is the side that won. Whenever somebody else is on the news desk, they're trying to show this is the side that stole. And we, were, we are the ones who are supposed to tell the public what the truth is. Kenya went to the polls in late 2007, and suddenly everything changed. <laughs> changed very much for journalists too. They were in the middle of violence. They were reporting from violent scenes, from burning buildings, from burning cars and motorbikes and taxis and everything else. There was a very clear ethnic overtone to this violence. Some stations were owned by politicians. What does a journalist do? Do they have to take a certain ethnic line? We are talking about uh, 1,300 people who died, uh, 600,000 people who were displaced within the country. So we knew that because we were so closely connected to the journalists, we just had to help them. We just had to engage with them and ask them what we could do. During at the height of the violence, we were invited for a round table um, by internews. They needed to express somehow what it had meant these 30 days of covering the story and how they would want that to be different, how they want, would want to be true professionals. If somebody said, I'm going to assist you. What would you tell them to assist you with? And out of my heart and without any prior preparation, I said, please, somebody come help me to reclaim my profession. From that round table, we were then able to go to specific radio stations to mentor them very, very intensely within the stations, you know, in-house in training for editors and journalists to help them develop editorial policies, which many of these stations hadn't had before. That led to a really wonderful program that allowed us to introduce Reporting for Peace, which, as the name tells you, is about how journalists can mitigate against violence and imagine a proactive role that they can play in a society. The Reporting for Peace uh, project started in December 2008. During one year, we worked with community vernacular radio station in Mombasa, in uh, uh, Nairobi, in the Rift Valley, in Kisumu. It was a fantastic project. When you are in a conflict environment, when you report uh, for conflict affected uh, communities, you cannot report like you, you do on a normal basis. So we trained uh, journalists, we trained talk showers to be mediators, basically, to go the extra mile, not to do only journalism, but to mediate, to be this link between the communities, the warring communities. The other component that we, was also incorporated into the Reporting for Peace project is that the, uh, we encourage the journalists to get out of their comfort zones. In this, for instance, in the Rift Valley, there were mainly Kikuyus, and maybe at times we'd find journalists who were from the Kalenjin group or even from the Luya group who were afraid uh, because of what had happened during the post-election violence, and they didn't know how the people would perceive them. There was a need to train journalists in obje objective reporting, and uh, the ability to remove yourself from the madding crowd or the fray, as it were, and be able to tell a story uh, without 
any strings attached to whichever side. The, the fact that we tell uh, journalists that uh, they have the power to make a difference if they want was fantastic. And then after the training they are like, okay, so if I say that, then this person can be offended this community can be offended. Okay, now I get it. And now we really have a wonderful, fully-fledged program called Land and Conflict Sensitive Journalism, where we work with a whole host of radio stations with these really targeted packages. So we follow a journalist over time, over 39 months this is, until way after the next election, to help them navigate this difficult path. There was a new constitution in Kenya that was passed in 2010. So during that moment, there was no hate speech broadcast in the radio stations. Uh, that was a fantastic achievement. The additional project that we have now looks at the other side of political or election coverage. There is the conflict, the politics, the ethnic dimension. That is our conflict program. And then there is purely the mechanics of an election. What does it take to gather results? What does it take to ensure that journalists have access to results? And while on the one hand media was being transformed to handle you know, a better response to the politics in the country, Kenya was also transforming in another way. With this digital revolution, of course in Kenya, but in fact worldwide, but Kenya is a supreme example of it, also came the trend for data journalism. And of course data journalism can only exist if there is data to access. So that also happened in Kenya. Amazing progressive steps have been made to post government data, reams and reams of statistics, trends, how many schools are in this region, how many hospitals are there, which hospitals don't have proper sanitation, how many doctors are there per patient, etc., etc. You can imagine those are just stories and stories and stories and trends that journalists can now mine. They can mine this data if they know how. As Internews has always done, bridging the gap. We bridged the gap when there was poor HIV reporting. We bridged the gap when there was violence on electoral reporting. So here, here we have data that's been availed to the, to the whole country and, and journalists are not making use of it as they should. Applications are being developed that journalists, again, are not making use of. So that's where Internews came in, to try and bridge this gap and bring techies and journalists closer. Journalism is about being alive to the moment, about being able to see trends, see ahead. It's really wonderful that USAID, our main donor, has also recognized this in that um, in singling out this office as being incredibly responsive towards trends, towards the political violence, now towards digital developments in Kenya. And when we look into the future, we need to see where that is going. We need to be absolutely alive to that because then we will have a following. We want journalists to follow us and, to, and, and if we're really successful, we want to pass it on to them to actually lead the way towards where trends are going next.